supposedly there is a metal chest of treasure hidden in the Rocky Mountains. A millionaire by the name of Forrest Fenn, F-E-N-N, -N, in his early 80s claimed to have hid the chest with a million dollars worth of diamonds, emeralds, rubies, and gold coins somewhere in the Rockies. Uh, several people claimed that they had seen this chest of of uh, riches at his home before he uh, hid it. It's not necessarily buried, but before he hid it in the Rockies. Uh, and he was uh, well off. He was a millionaire. He could have such a thing. He left behind a poem of clues that you can follow if you're so inclined uh, to look for it. His purpose was to try to get families and children outside enjoying nature more. And I guess that's one way of trying to do that. Many people have searched for the treasure. He himself estimated that at least 350,000 people had been looking for the treasure before his death. Um, but it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. At least four hopeful treasure hunters have lost their lives looking for the treasure. For example, in, 19, in 2017, 53-year-old Jeff Murphy was hunting the treasure in Yellowstone National Park when he disappeared. The park rangers found his body at the bottom of a slide of a 500-foot mountain peak. Some of the treasure hunters are pretty obsessive. Ricky Idlett, a steamboat operator on the Mississippi River, admits most of my 12 hours every night, I'm online looking up clues. Every night. Every night I'm looking. The desire for treasure can become all-consuming. It can take over your life. But that's not what we were created for. We were created for a personal relationship with God. God is our treasure. And we should be pursuing things that contribute to that relationship. And Jesus points this out in the Sermon on the Mount. We pick up this morning in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6 and verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I remind you again that Jesus is speaking these words to the first century Jews of that day, and most of them were poor. Uh, they were poor people. They struggled to get enough food to eat and clothes to wear. Uh, cloth was not cheap. Uh, most of the cloth was either wool or uh, cotton of some kind. Uh, there were other materials, but those were, were the primary things. And uh, they didn't have any chemicals to prevent moths. Jesus mentions moths here. Uh, moth lay their eggs for larvae, 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 no, I never know how to pronounce that word, uh, and the larvae eat keratin, uh, and keratin is found in uh, uh, animal fibers like wool and silk and fur. So moth-eaten clothes was a common problem in those days, uh, if they had extra clothes that they had stored. And theft was a common problem. Uh, most people didn't have locks on their doors. If you went in at night, you could bolt the door, but they didn't have metal locks with keys and such. Uh, thefts were a common problem uh, in that day. And, and since food and clothing were in short supply, that's what the thieves would take if they found it in your home. Uh, maybe cooking utensils and pots and that kind of thing. And, and they didn't, a lot of people didn't have banks or didn't trust banks. A lot of people hid money, what extra money they might have, instead of what they carried around, they might hide it in the ground in or around their homes. Even today, uh, people with metal 
detectors go around looking for old villages and stuff and and find coins buried around houses because you know maybe dad hid the money but he died and nobody knows where the coins were they had very little of the world's goods but what they had was like treasure to them but jesus warns them not to be uh, caught up in accumulating and storing up such things, even necessary things like food and clothing. By comparison, we're rich. We're rich. We're well-fed and well-clothed and well-housed. We have so much that, I mean, there's so much food and clothing in America that if somebody broke into your house today, they wouldn't steal any of that. I mean, maybe if you had a mink coat, they'd steal the mink coat or a really nice leather jacket. But, you know, they're not looking for clothing. They're not looking for, for food. They're not going to go into your freezer and wonder if you had a steak or, you know, something like that. They're after other stuff. And we have other stuff. We've got uh, all kinds of appliances and gizmos and, and uh, entertainment devices to make our lives easier and less boring. We already own a lot of treasures. So when we read these words, we're, we're reading them with a little bit different perspective than the original listeners. We already own a lot of stuff. We already have stuff treasured up and stored up. Um, in addition to the, to the regular stuff that most of us have, maybe you have a collection of stuff. Maybe you have a coin collection or a stamp collection or a or, uh, uh, Bradford Exchange stuff. <laughs> Every week in a Parade magazine, there's a Bradford Exchange. And it's always bigger. I would rip that thing out of there because I don't like it. But we continue to get more and more stuff. We have, we have more money coming in than we need for our necessities. And so we spend the extra on extra stuff. Stuff we don't need. Stuff we like, but we don't necessarily need it. So Jesus' words have a little bit different feel to us, but he's warning us too about not accumulating and storing up the things of the world. The desire for money and uh, that we need for the things that we need and more earthly goods beyond can lead to problems. Paul talks about some of these problems in 1 Timothy. We're going to come back to Matthew there, but I want to take you to 1 Timothy this morning, chapter 6 and verse 17. He starts off by saying, command those who are rich. Now, I don't know anybody in this room who is rich. I, I know some people have considerably more money than others in this room, but, but none of us here would consider ourselves rich. Rich are the people who can go out and buy any car they want. Just, you know, here, here's cash. Mercedes or, you know, whatever. Uh, the rich people are the people who fly first class across the country uh, or stay at the, uh, expensive hotels and such. And I don't know, we, we can't afford to do those things. We don't consider ourselves rich, but rich is really a, just a word by comparison. It's all a matter of who you compare yourself to. We are richer, everyone in this room is richer today than anybody that lived in Jesus' day, including Jesus. So we could easily fall into that category. And by today's standards of, of the world, uh, we're all in the top 15%, uh, top 10% worldwide uh, of income. So Paul's writing to the rich. We'll pick up again there in verse uh, 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Let me draw several points from this passage for us this morning. The first one is this, having more money and goods than you need is not a sin. It's not a sin to be rich. There's nowhere in the Bible that even hints that it's a sin to be rich, to have more than you need. He's 
ended that passage there by saying that God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God, God wants us to enjoy the things of the world, the things that he has so blessed us with. Uh, that's why he made them. But Paul does make some, have some warnings for us in this passage. Money can lead to pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance. And Paul instructs Timothy to warn the rich not to be arrogant. He didn't say, give all your money away. But he does say, don't be arrogant about what you have. Arrogance assumes the rich are better people than the poor. Have you ever looked down on someone who is less well off than you are? Such an attitude is a sin. Arrogance assumes that the rich deserve the riches they have. You assume the poor are just lazier than you, that they don't work as hard as you are, and that's why they're, la that's why they're poor. There are many reasons that people end up poor. Uh, and not through any fault of their own. The, uh, I learned that lesson years ago when I was working in, our, in, in the cat food closet uh, because people would come in and we'd ask them questions about, about their income and their situation. And, and uh, sometimes they'd drive up in a car that was a lot better than my car. And you're thinking, how could first person be poor? But through circumstances that was no fault of their own, they did. They ended up poor and, and had to come to the food closet looking for food. The pandemic has shown all of us that. Uh, the pandemic has put lots of people out of work. And, uh, and many of those people have ended up poor because of circumstances beyond their control. We must avoid blanket statements about those who are poor, who are less well off than us, and assume that they deserve to be poor, and we deserve to have what we have. Arrogance fails to give God the credit he deserves for our riches. God provided you with your family, your education, your uh, intelligence, your health, your job opportunities, and, and other circumstances that contributed to you being able to have what you have today. Arrogance lacks humility and gratitude to God. And there is also the temptation to trust in money. The temptation to trust in money. I learned this lesson <laughs> years ago when I was in, finishing up college. Uh, I, I decided I wasn't going to go to seminary right out of college like most people did who were going to seminary. Seminary is a graduate level school. Uh, I decided, uh, I think from the Lord's leading, that I would work a secular job for a few years and, and save some money toward seminary. And uh, so I, had, I ended up with a, a secular job uh, where my dad worked and uh, was working, worked for two years, was saving money up. My goal was that I wouldn't have to work a part-time job my first year in seminary. I'd have enough money for uh, my books and my rent and, and food and that kind of thing. And so I was saving up toward that. Um, about six months before I was going to quit that job and enter seminary, I had major car repair. I had my own car and uh, major car repair, uh, about $600, which was a lot of money then, uh, but more than it is today. And... Uh, but I had the money because it was in the bank. I'd been saving it for school, but I had to use it for the car. And in that process and in thinking and praying about that, the Lord showed me that I was not trusting in him for next year at school. I was trusting in the money in the bank. And so I needed to repent of that misplaced trust. Are you trusting in the Lord for your living? Or are you trusting in the pension? Are you trusting in Social Security? Are you trusting in your savings? Are you trusting in maybe a home that's been paid for? Are you trusting in the Lord or are you trusting in these other things? The temptation is to trust in money if we have it. 
Well, let's go back and read. We're going to come back to 1 Timothy, but let's go back to Matthew and uh, read the rest of that Sermon on the Mount passage, beginning in verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So what does Jesus want us to do? What does Jesus want us to do? Well, first of all, he wants us to change our wants. He wants us to change our wants. If you have more money coming in than you have needs, there's the temptation to buy more unneeded stuff, more treasures. We have to work against that temptation, especially, especially today in America. We have to eliminate from in us this desire for more and more of the world's things. Remember last week we were talking about temptation, and that temptation to sin comes from desires that are in us, evil desires that are in us. And uh, that would include the desire for greed, the desire for more and more and more for me. That's what we're talking about this week. So we need to realize that desire in us and, and work against that temptation and do so by the help of the Holy Spirit. Jesus warns us against setting our hopes, our hearts, our eyes, uh, our faith in money and treasures. Such does not belong or go along with serving God. Bad eyes, he's talking about bad eyes, are focused on earthly treasures, and good eyes are focused on treasures in heaven. We use a phrase in our culture, and don't hear it all the time, but we use a phrase in our culture that I think goes along with what Jesus is talking there when he's talking about eyes. Uh, we say that something has caught your eye. Something has caught his eye. Something has caught my eye. Meaning that, that, that something, we're attracted to something, we've desired something, we're, we're, we're uh, focused on something that we want to have, something we want to obtain, something we want to do. Some years back, motorcycles caught my eye. Uh, I talked about it with my wife. She said, sure, you want to get a bike? No, no sweat, go ahead. But uh, at that time, I still had uh, sons at home and I thought, well, I'm not going to get a motorcycle while they're here because I don't want them thinking they need a motorcycle, you know. So I thought, in the future, when my sons are gone out on their own, have a car and whatever, you know, then I'll, I'll get a bike. Uh, but even though it was going to be down the road several years at least, I was thinking about motorcycles all the time. Every time one go by, I turn and watch it go down the road, you know. I was reading the motorcycle magazines in the store, at the library. You know, it, it really became not an obsession, but a really part, a big part of, of what I was thinking about in my free time. Uh, I'd already investigated taking the uh, motorcycle classes at the community college, taking the exam for my, you know, test for my license and such, and, uh, and on and on. In time, God revealed to me that this desire was too strong, that it was something, not that it was wrong to have a motorcycle, but that my involvement in this process was, was it was taking too much of me, too much of my uh, attention, my focus. <coughs> so I was able to back off and I dropped the idea altogether. Jesus is calling for us to change what we desire, to change our wants. To limit, not to say I'm going to get everything I can with what I have, but to limit. Secondly, to set your eyes, your heart on spiritual treasures. He wants us to set our heart on spiritual treasures, treasures in heaven. Let's go back to First Timothy. I think there are clues there about part of what he's talking about. We pick up in. Uh, Chapter 6, again, beginning in verse 6. Again, he's writing to Timothy of what Timothy should do and what Timothy should teach 
those in the church to do. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith, the Christian faith, and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Paul encouraged Timothy to have his eyes set on the, the fruit of the Spirit that can be and should be growing in us as Christians who follow Jesus. Don't set your eyes on becoming rich or gaining more worldly stuff uh, for your treasure. God is our treasure. Make it your desire to grow close to him to live with him, to love with him, to endure with him. So set your eyes, your heart on spiritual treasures, and then thirdly, to use your earthly treasures to help others. Use what extra God has given you to help others. Well, we'll look at the last part of this passage and uh, pick up there in 1 Timothy 6, verse 18. Command them, he's talking to the, about the rich again, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Now, he didn't mean that, that the rich could... Uh, by their way into salvation. He's, he's talking about the uh, lay up a treasure for themselves as a firm foundation of the coming age. He's not talking about earning uh, salvation, uh, earning eternal life by giving uh, money away, by giving uh, uh, money to the poor, or doing good deeds. That's not what he's talking about. Instead, he's talking about uh, other blessings on top of salvation. He's talking to uh, Christian people who are already Christians, but they're building on the foundation of their salvation uh, additional blessings that God has for us as we participate with him in doing the good deeds that he's planned for us to do. But Jesus leaves us with a question. He leaves us with a question. He says, don't pursue earthly treasures, pursue heavenly treasures. And, and, and we get some idea of what those are here and, and, and be doing good deeds with the extra and, and, and ministry to the poor and others with their needs. But he doesn't say how much. How much should I give? Is there dollar amounts I give? Is there a percentage what I should give of uh, not necessarily all your income, of, but of, of the extra? Because some of the extra... You know, God gives us for our enjoyment. How much did I give? That's one of those mysteries that we're left with. One of those unexplained things that we read in the scriptures. I know God's will is for me to do this, but he doesn't exactly tell me how to do this. How do I, how do I deal with that open-ended question? I believe that if Jesus is Lord of your life, and you're grateful for the salvation that he's provided you, and you are living led by the Holy Spirit, he will tell you when and how to give, and how much to give, and what good deeds to be doing with it. That requires us to constantly be living by faith, constantly be looking to the Spirit to say, how do you want me to live today as a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you taking hold of the life that is truly life? That's how he ends there. 
so that, the, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The abundant life that Jesus talked about isn't just eternal life in heaven. It's a, it's a different kind of life now. It's a life of blessings now here in this life on earth. Blessings that, spiritual blessings that you can only experience if you're walking close with Jesus. If you're being led by the Holy Spirit. God has wonderful blessings for you beyond your initial conversion. So set your heart, set your eyes on those things rather than the earthly things, and you will be blessed. God wants to bless you in many ways, but he cannot do so until you believe on Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and turn your life over to him as Lord. And I encourage you to do that today.